Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. I'm continuing my discussion with Miko Pellet. His father was a prominent Israeli general. He wrote the book, The General's Son, and now joins me again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So we're continuing our discussion. We're into part three or part four, and you really should go back and watch the beginning and get the whole context of this, because uh, we're going to pick up the discussion where we were. Uh, you said in 2005, you came to the conclusion that this idea of a two-state solution wasn't possible, nor was it right. Um, that there should be a one, as you said in the last segment, one state voting for all, not a Jewish state. Now that goes against the core of your father's beliefs, because as much as he was for compromise and mitigating the uh, occupation and so, he certainly was very much for a Jewish state. So this is a big departure for you. Yes. Yes, it was, uh, it was a big departure. It was a realization that it's all, it's all one state anyway already. In other words, by taking the West Bank, Israel didn't begin the occupation of Palestine. Israel completed the, the, the occupation of Palestine. The occupation of Palestine began when the state of Israel was established in 1948. The majority of Palestine was occupied then. Two areas that were left out were the West Bank and the Gaza Strip for, for reasons that had nothing to do with, well, that had to do only with Israeli internal politics. They decided to stop where they decided to stop, and the West Bank and the Gaza Strip were delineated by Israel. Twenty years later, the opportunity presents itself, and Israel takes the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and from that point on, people refer to the occupied to Palestinian territories as just those two areas. And that becomes the narrative. Um, and then for my father and people like my father, who were more liberal Zionists and believed in compromise, that was really the kind of a, that was where the compromise was going to be. We we're going to allow the Palestinians to establish their own little state in these two areas that w the state of Israel was willing to give them under conditions that were uh, favorable to the state of Israel. So there's really no compromise on the basic idea of Zionism, on the basic ideology, on the fact that the majority of Palestine is now Israel. Um, but the reality is that, again, Israel didn't begin the occupation of, in 1967, it completed the occupation. And when we look at what the commanders were saying as they took the West Bank and the Gaza Strip was that we had finished the job. We completed the job that they felt should have been completed in 1948. The officers of 1948 were very frustrated that they didn't take the West Bank then, you know. But it was a political decision and it was done. Now they had the opportunity, now their commanders, now their officers, now their generals, and the opportunity presented itself. He took the West Bank, and by the way, the Golan Heights, which they'd wanted to take anyway, because the opportunity was there, what they call the fog of so-called fog of war. Um, and that was it. And from that moment on, literally from that moment on, Israel began destroying Palestinian towns and neighborhoods in the West Bank and building massively for Jews only in the West Bank. And um, when you look back, that's exactly what Israel did 20 years earlier, or from 1948 up to that point, in every other place in Palestine, in the Galilee, in the Nakab Desert, on the coast, everywhere. In other words, Israel building for Jews only on Palestinian land is not unique to the West Bank. This is what happens across the country. So I was beginning to come, that was the realization that, that, you know, that moment when I realized this has actually been happening everywhere. None of this is reversible. The only way forward, if we care for justice, if uh, some sort at least of justice for the Palestinians, is to undo the state of Israel and establish a real democracy with equal rights so Palestinians have an equal voice. And that is really the only way in which Palestinians are ever going to have any rights because the state of Israel will always preclude that. Now, when you come out and say something like that, then and now, but when you first, uh, not only are you breaking with a core belief of your father, but it is, it is the fundamental core belief of the entire Israeli culture and, and such. And, and the whole raison d'etre of the state is based on this idea that after t you know, 2,000 years and so of persecution of Jews for being Jews, uh, there needs to be this Jewish state as the safety for Jews. Um, you now are become in the eyes of much of Israeli society, what they like to say, especially the propaganda machine, 
that you are now a self-hating Jew. Um, you are now contributing to anti-Semitism. Um, you, in a way, you are anti-Semitic yourself, or they twist that into the self-hating thing. M my point is there's a, a very powerful propaganda machine, and not just, and, and even in Israel, and to some extent North America, it is a popular opinion. Uh, you are more than an outcast, you become an enemy. Well, you know, the, 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 the equation or the con uh, uh, between Zion, what it means to be a Zionist and what it means to be Jewish is a relatively a new thing. You know, in the early days, most Jewish communities rejected Zionism. Today, Zionism has, has become, I think Brent Rosen coined this phrase, the, the kind of the new secular religion of North American and European Jews and many others perhaps. In you, other you might want to say that again because most people don't know that in the early days most Jewish committees were anti-Zionist. Yeah, in the early days yeah. if we look at uh, you know the J Jewish culture and Jewish communities in the early days in the beginning of the 20th, early 20th century and really all the way up to the establishment of the State of Israel and even beyond I would say, uh, Jewish communities viewed the Zionists as, as a bunch of crazies. You know, what is this crazy idea about going to some Arab land and, 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 and creating a state for Jews there? And the reality is that very few Jews went. Uh, no, no, no good Jewish family wanted their children to become Zionists. They wanted yeah. them to become good Jews and do whatever it is that Jews do. There's an interesting yeah. quote from Truman in some of the papers that came out later where he's, he, even though himself he was somewhat anti-Semitic and a certain many of his political allies were, um, he was actually ready after World War II to let many of the Jewish refugees into the United States, apparently, and was visited by some of the Zionists who talked him out of it. Yeah. And uh, he, this thing, he says, I don't understand these people. Yeah. We're about to, we want to give them refuge, yeah. and the Zionists are telling us, no, yeah. send them to Israel where there's nothing. Yeah. Well, the Zionists were, were uh, you know, they had, they had a very, very, they were ideologues and they had an agenda. Um, and like I said, they created these myths that the Jews are a nation, that the Bible is a history book, and that Palestine is, is the homeland of the Jews. And that all Jews are the descendants of this ancient tribe that used to live there 3,000 years ago, which were the ancient Hebrews. You know, if you look at European Jews, if you look like, like me, or even you know, if you look at me, I don't look like I, I, I have any descendants that come from the Middle East, you know. But this was the accepted story, and today you talk about North America. You talk about listen, look to look at look at uh, history, high school history books here in the United States. When they learn about ancient times, they learn about the ancient Hebrews as the Jews. They learn about Moses, Abraham, and D King David as though they were historical figures, even though none of these are historical figures. They're all biblical. So I mean, this narrative really took off, really developed, and was really accepted here. How does your father, who is an uh, intelligent, bright, secular man who's not, you know, he's not religious. How do you take the Bible as a history book? Well, that's exactly it. They secularized the Bible. The Zionists secularized the Bible. So they adored King David and they adored all these other figures and they made them sound like they're completely secular. And they tied them into their own kind of secular Zionist, socialist, uh, national socialist, I suppose, in a way, um, ideology, which is what Zionism was and what Zionism is. And they hated the Arabs, but even more than the Arabs, they hated the Orthodox Jews who rejected Zionism, and they hated Jewish Again, communities. Again, something a lot of people don't know. Most of the Orthodox yeah. Jews rejected Zionism back in that day. Back in that day, until yeah. there was some kind of a compromise between some of the Orthodox communities who became Zionist. But the, the, but the hardcore, the main core of, Zion, of, of Orthodox communities rejected, and many still do, the idea of a Jewish state. And Jewish communities who wanted to remain where they were, you know, who were happy to be in Europe or in America or wherever it is that they were in Iraq and so forth, and had no interest in so, coming. So, 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 you know, when you start speaking like this, um, you're going to be a target. I mean, what what in you does that rather than keep your karate school going? I mean, why do you? I I understand your niece's, you know, was killed in the bombing, and I understand. Yeah reacting to it, but yeah. you, you are now making yourself a target rather than, you know, living, just living your life. Well, this is my life. I think uh, it was kind of under, it was keeping, I kept it hidden and kept, kept it under control and, you know, in a way, uh, under the surface, as long as things were, I suppose, working fine. But 
after she was killed, and then the peace talks fall apart in 2000, and all the myth, thing after thing after thing, it just, you know, it was something in me that I had no, uh, very little control over. And I don't see myself as a target at all. I see, what I see is that for reasons that I don't fully understand, because my father was a general and the background that I have, that gives me a voice. And if I can use that voice to say these things and bring about some kind of sanity and bring about some kind of uh, justice to, to back to Palestine, then that's, that's what, then I'm doing the right thing. And so really it wasn't until the book, my book came out in 2012, the end of 2012, that I kind of moved beyond teaching karate and became, this became my, you know, what I do full time, is writing and speaking and so forth and traveling about this issue and going to Palestine and, you know, causing as much trouble as I can while I'm there. That's, that's really what I do now. But I feel that this is, um, you know, I, I don't feel I'm targeted. I don't feel quite the opposite, actually. The Israeli propaganda machine, Zionist propaganda machine, obviously, as everyone knows, labels just about any critique of Israel as being anti-Semitic. Yeah. But some critique of Israel is motivated by anti-Semitism. And I wonder, does, does that not get enough attention, especially when one's trying to talk to you know, ordinary Israelis or North American Jews? You know, the idea of Israel, the, the, the ideology that Israel that established Israel, the reality in Israel is racist and racism. Supporting Israel is supporting racism. You know, it's like supporting apartheid in South Africa was supporting racism. Supporting, um, um, you know, mass incarceration of blacks in America is racism. There are certain things that are just racism. There's no compromise. There's no gray area, you know. There is no way that you can support Israel and not be racist because it is a racist, uh, it is a racist project. It's a racist colonialist project. Um, and it's brutally violent. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's um, so I think if we start describing the violence and the racism and the laws, it, it, you know, it, 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 people wouldn't believe it. It's so horrifying. So that is my issue, that we need to get rid of that particular racism. Now, the fact that some people Hey, Jews, as well as Arabs, as well as blacks, well, fine. You know, the racism goes all around. Usually racism is kind of you know, colorblind in a way. People hate Jews, they hate blacks, they hate everybody else. That's fine. The point is that this is racism. There is no way to support a Jewish state in Palestine without supporting stepping all over the rights of Palestinians. Yeah, you know? and I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. But, but what I'm saying is that some of the anti-Zionist rhetoric is coming from sources that are really thoroughly anti-Semitic, and it kind of converges with the legitimate critique of... That hasn't I, been my I, experience. I mean, I, 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 the people that I work with, the people that I talk to, the people that I meet, the people that I you know, engage in, uh, with in, in conversation and in conferences, and uh, that hasn't been my experience at all. I've not seen that. Well, I've not, heard about it. Yeah, I'm not talking so much within the circles yeah. I, I would yeah. think you travel. And in. perhaps there is, yeah. but again, I, that hasn't, that's really not something that has come across that I've, that I've experienced or seen. So I don't really know how to comment. I know that people say that. I know that there's that. People claim that that, ex that exists. I haven't. I haven't seen it. You know, it's not been, you know, in front of me in any place. Okay. Yeah. Uh, t talk a bit about BDS and boycott, divestment, sanctions. Um, the, the, it's, it's certainly. Uh, it seems to be having a heck of a lot more effect these days than I think a lot of people thought it would in the in the in, in the beginning. Yeah. Um, you're involved in it. Just where where do you think it's at, and how much influence or effect is it having on on the Israeli state? Yeah. Well, my involvement in it is that I'm a big supporter. I'm not so much like in the inner works of it, but inner inner workings. But um, the, the the call to uh, boycott, uh, divest, and impose sanctions on Israel came from Palestine. It came from Palestinian civil society, probably the largest coalition of 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 of, of Palestinian organizations and groups and individuals ever put together, came out with this call, uh, resting on the experience of South Africa where BDS was, had a big part in bringing down apartheid and saying this is how you're going to help them. This is how people around the world can gather together and support the, Palestine, the cause for justice in Palestine. Um, it's proven to be very dedicated, very principled. Of course, it's, uh, it's nonviolent, although Israel tries to paint it as though it's terrorism and it's violence. There's nothing violent uh, about it at all. The reason it's being successful is because of its dedication and because of the fact that the people who are involved are principled, um, and it's working because again, it's a smart, it's a smart form of of, uh, of resistance. 
Now, um, they've had several campaigns which have been, we've gone, you know, we've have, have gone very well against uh, Caterpillar, against G4S, now against HP. The level of, I agree with you that I don't know that anybody could have anticipated it would, it would, it would be this, um, this powerful at this point, and I'm glad it is, I wish it was even more powerful, but we know that at the APAC convention, every presidential candidate talked about BDS as though it is a terrorist threat, as though it's something that has to be killed, you know, and destroyed. Uh, Israeli Israel just had a major conference on how to fight BDS. Israeli Channel 10 News came here to the U.S. and did a five-part series about the BDS in America and how is it that our good friend America allows this anti-Semitism to take hold and so on. Um, they interviewed me. They interviewed a lot of Jewish, many Jewish activists here in the U.S. Um, and so it's it's definitely gaining ground. It's doing the right thing. And I think the thing that bothers Israel the most or maybe several things one is that you can't kill it because it's it's not armed so they don't really know what to do with it the other thing is that there is a sense that it's working in other words israeli academics feel isolated um israeli products are being are being taken off shelves uh the campaigns the bds campaigns are working and they're gaining a lot of ground um and there's a sense that there's a legitimacy to palestinian resistance and if there's a legitimacy to Palestinian resistance, that is biting away from the legitimacy of the state of Israel. You know, the two go hand in hand. And like I said earlier, the legitimacy is the holy grail. We cannot let that go. We, Israel will kill and, 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 and destroy in order to maintain and protect the legitimacy. Um, and this is what they're trying to do, but I, I believe they're failing. They're spending hundreds of millions of dollars trying to fight BDS and trying to fight what they call the BDS, which is all the Palestine solidarity um, that exists, and they're failing miserably. I mean, the conversation on campuses with uh, students for justice in Palestine all over the U.S. is growing, is improving, is becoming uh, much more, of, it's a much more vigorous uh, debate and, and discourse than anybody thought would ever take place on campuses and in churches in America. Um, and like I said, it's dedicated. It's the right thing to do. And I think it's, 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 I think it's, it's, we're only scratching the surface. So in the beginning of the series of interviews, I quoted Alice Walker, who said your yeah. book left her hopeful. Yes. What leaves you hopeful in all of this? How do you end up hopeful? Well, because I think the, the transformation of this very violent and racist regime that is controlling Palestine today, which is what we call the state of Israel, um, the transformation of that into a secular democracy with equal rights is inevitable. I think it's Why? because, it, well, I'll, I'll give you several reasons. To begin with, the reality is unsustainable. You have over 2 million people living in the Gaza Strip. The population of Gaza Strip just went beyond 2 million a few weeks ago. Um, now, the Gaza Strip, for anybody who doesn't know, is a five-minute drive from Israeli towns and cities, you know, inside of, towns and cities inside of Israel. Uh, we have two million people living in a very, in one of the most densely populated areas in the world, with no access to clean water, with no access to basic most health care, with very little access to nutrition, to food. They're already food insecure, which is, by United Nations definitions, one step before hunger. And a child in Gaza with a curable cancer will die while five minutes away a child in Israel of the same curable cancer will live. This is a reality that cannot be sustained. Well, the Israeli Besides state sure seems to think it can as long as it's supported by the American state, and the American state seems to have no problem with what's going on in They're Gaza. Wrong. When Netanyahu comes to Congress, yeah. everyone stands up and gives, what, 25 standing ovations. Yeah. Well, you know, they used to talk about Nelson Mandela as a terrorist in the late 80s, and the United States still did not support boycotting South Africa as late as the late 80s. In 1994, Mandela was already president of South Africa. So these things, when they start to change, they change very fast. I think the reality on the ground is unsustainable, regardless of what Israelis might think or regardless of what American politicians might think. It is not sustainable. You have a population within Israel proper that Israeli citizens were Palestinians who live in what is, can only be described as refugee camps in some cases. Some of the towns, in, in, other than the neglect, and the racism is, is, is really something that, that, that people rarely talk about and need to talk about. An entire population of citizens who live really 
under the under the control of the Israeli secret police. You've got this reality in the West Bank where where where, where ghettos, Palestinian ghettos, are being are being created. It is not sustainable. The majority of the population are Palestinians right now, between the river and the sea. Um, BDS is growing. Palestine solidarity is growing. The Palestinian resistance is getting gaining more and more support and more and more respect. You've got Nobel laureates and you've got. Um, you know, big names, Alice Walker and others, uh, Roger Waters supporting the Palestinian cause. There is, a, there is a momentum here that cannot be stopped. And I would be surprised if it like, takes more than 10 years for this process to, have, to actually take place. Well, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks thank for you. joining us. Absolutely. And thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.